Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar. Today, our presentation is Flight and Flying with Dave Taylor. Really excited about this one. As always, my name is Stephanie. I am the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I want to say a very special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation for supporting the community program work and presentations that we do. Um, and I also want to mention that all of our February programs are now on our website. Let me go to the next page. Um, you can sign up for any of these programs at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash events. Uh, we have both in-person and virtual presentations available for February and soon to come uh, March as well. Anything in yellow you see on the screen is virtual. So we have a Love Birds Week. Uh, we're offering different presentation on birds uh, every single day during that week to prepare for the backyard bird count. Um, so those are $5 webinars each, uh, and uh, that, that just allows us to continue our programming and it supports us as well. So if you're interested in, in coming to virtual presentations, we have lots of those as well next month. Um, the Riverwood Conservancy is a charity organization, so we greatly appreciate all types of your support uh, during these past couple of years from programs, including uh, participating, membership, donations, and even volunteering. So thank you, everyone. Um, and before we get to our presentation from Dave today, the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is a territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And today we have Dave Taylor back again, um, who is a wildlife photographer and author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology. His most recent book, Black Bears and Natural History is available now. Dave also focuses his efforts on producing educational videos and material about wildlife for both the public and to support school curriculum. He has traveled throughout the world capturing nature with his camera and frequently visits Tanzania where he guides wildlife safaris. So today, uh, if you have any questions for Dave, please comment in the chat or the Q&A section. And if you're watching on Facebook, just comment down below and I'll be reviewing those as well. And we will bring those to Dave at the end of this presentation. Dave, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for covering for me for a few minutes there. Um, so first of all, I wanna welcome you and happy new year to everyone. It's uh, my first presentation of the year. And this one has a bit of a story behind it. Um, it began last, fall when I was asked to develop some support videos for a program that Riverwood was looking to offer to schools on movement. So I produced uh, some videos showing how animals move on the land, mostly mammals, in fact, entirely mammals. And as that went along, I uh, enjoyed it. I thought the videos were well received. Uh, I'd extend it and look at the possibility of doing videos for flight for the Riverwood Conservancy and for public and schools and educators or whatever. And that's kind of the background to what you're about to see, but there's more to the story and I will continue it after I show you this video. This is the video that I produced to introduce the concept of flight. Um, it's about nine minutes long, and if you were going to use this in a classroom, you may choose to use the whole nine minutes. You may just use snippets. And fortunately, I've taken it and I've broken it into smaller snippets, which are being posted um, over the next couple of weeks, and they're going to look at various aspects of birds in flight. But that's not what the story is about. So let me just share the screen here. And remember to do everything I'm supposed to do and turn check all the boxes. And hopefully this will work.
So that's my video on flight. And if I were showing that to a bunch of students or to an audience like you, uh, hang on a second. I've got another video already. Crap. There, sorry about that. Um, I would use that as an introduction to the topic of flight. And I'd have you look at it and I'd say, what did you notice about this? And one of the things that first of all strikes me right off the beginning is, how does that egret fly and drag its feet? Or how do those red-winged blackbirds manage to fly in such a mass of flock and not hit each other? And then you can start looking at other basic questions. Well, these are questions I asked during the production of this and I happened to read a book and it was called this one, Loon Lessons. And I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, the different drummer in Oakville. This is where I picked this book up. Uh, sorry, Burlington, different drummer in Burlington. Uh, I was there looking for books as I often do. Saw this one, I hadn't seen any other place, picked it up and I really enjoyed it. I like looms to begin with, but it was some parts of this. This fella, James Peruk, goes through information on loons that I was just blown away by. I just couldn't, um, couldn't believe all the things I was seeing and reading. And one particular thing happened to do with the wings, the wingtips of the loon, the wingtips. And so he made a point of saying that the tips of the, the loon's wings are black. And there's a reason for that. Now, that reason connects to this book on dinosaurs, and I'll get back to this in a moment. But we're going to get to this, and you thought you were just going to learn about flight. We are. It also connects to this book, which is just an incredible volume. It shows all the birds in the world. I had a good Christmas, believe me. I mean, all you have to buy me for Christmas is books. Hey, I'm a cheap date. But let's get back to this. He made a point of saying in here that the loon's wingtips are black because they need to withstand extra pressure from coming down and maybe hitting water or just because of the end of the feathers, they have to bend more and be more flexible. They have something in them called melosomes, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And he said that most birds have dark wingtips because of the pressure put on those wingtips. Well, that got me wondering, well, that's not true. Because if you look at that video, the egret that was flying around doesn't have white tips. So I started looking through this book and I wanted to check out particularly the egrets. Let me just find the page, here they are. So there's a page of just egrets and herons. And there are some, like the great egret that we have in, even in Riverwood, that do not have white tips. And swans don't have white tip or black tips on their feathers, or on their wings, rather. So was he right? Well, then I started counting the birds. And true, the three or four species of swan do not have black tips on their wing feathers, uh, some of the egrets don't, but out of all the egrets in the book, and there's about a hundred or so illustrated, only about four or five just have pure white. So there must have been something to this. So this, this melon, melanzone, um, has a stiffening thing. And it turns out that the lack of that chemical is why I have my golden well, some people call them white locks. Uh, it has to do with our skin color. It has to do with our hair color. Um, and it's why most birds are the colors they are. But that I found out from this book. Now, this fella, Michael J. Benton, is a British scientist. 
and he's written a couple of books on dinosaurs. This is his latest. But what really put him on the map, I think, as far as dinosaurs go, is he was one of the first, there were several people, and I can't remember the names, who started looking at the fossils of dinosaurs. And in China, they were finding lots of feathered dinosaurs. And so we now know, for instance, that dinosaurs, many of the theropod dinosaurs and perhaps some of the other species had feathers, including the T-Rex. Um, and that was fine. But somebody said, well, what are these marks in these feathers? And they looked at it through a magnifying glass and lo and behold, they found they were melosomes. These, these crystallized, they, chemicals that, that fossilized, and I'm not explaining it very well. But what they were able to do is they were able to take and analyze that feather pattern, and they were able to come up with, and this is what this book starts out really looking at. And I'll just find the cover picture. By analyzing the feather patterns on the dinosaurs, they were able to actually for the first time, tell us what color a dinosaur was. In this case, browns, blacks, and whites. And it turns out that if you've ever seen tar on the road, and you've ever noticed how the tar kind of glistens, you can see a whole rainbow of color, even though tar itself is black. Well, in these melosomes, the, the, they give pigment and if there are none of them, the pigment is white, hence my hair. If there are a lot of them, the pigment is black. And if there's some place in between, the pigment ranges from black to gr uh, browns through grays and even kind of a reddish tinge back to white. You don't get blue. Uh, blue is, and the colors of iridescence that you see in hummingbirds, that's another thing. Uh, it has to do with reflective patterns in the feathers, just like in butterflies. Well, I thought this was uh, really fascinating stuff. So I'm going to go switch to another slideshow. This is a slideshow. And share screen. There's no sound with this, no music. So <clears throat> that got me thinking more about flight. Now, there are all sorts of animals that fly. It's not just birds. And we're talking here powered flight, not particularly gliding flight. So we're not talking about sugar gliders or flying squirrels or flying snakes, all of which exist, by the way. So insects, insects fly in a number of manners, some of them very strange. This was one of those birds that they found. And if you look at this picture, you can see the fossil feathers. This was Aetiopteryx, and it was for a long time known as the first bird. It had a lot of features that were very much like a dinosaur, but people were not prepared to believe that a bird and a dinosaur were the, first, the same thing when this was found 150 years ago. It was found in Germany in a pit. But as we found more and more, and in this one, it's hard to recognize it, but you see the black around the uh, feathers? That's this chemical I'm talking about, this melosome. And if you analyze that, you can figure out the pattern of what that bird is. And the same with this dinosaur. Now, this is not a flying dinosaur. This is the dinosaur <clears throat> that walked, couldn't get off the ground, but probably used its feathers to intimidate rivals and show off um, is features to the ladies. The black blob in the center is part of his stomach contents. So we didn't know even 30 years ago what dinosaur colors were. We thought they were green and brown. So if you were sketching dinosaurs, you might give them a nice pattern. This is my attempt at an archaeopteryx. This is another attempt at another type of dinosaur. This one glided, it didn't fly. But this one in particular was one of the ones found in China. And this is one of the ones they analyzed. And they knew from the analysis that it was shades of 
kind of a reddish brown and black. So this sketch of it flying through the forest after a dragonfly is a fairly accurate representation of the coloration of this, this animal. And it's featured in the book. And then you get museums that start to display them using this technology. This one is more fantasy, because this one I don't think they have actually been able to analyze the colors yet. This one is probably fairly accurate. This is what the raptors should probably look like in Jurassic Park. This one with its long tail feathers, they've been able to analyze the color patterns. And you will find this one illustrated in his book. This is a more modern representation of a T-Rex with feathers on rather than just the scaly crater that you see in movies. So feathers came before flight, but birds did come along and feathers evolved. And as they evolved, we began to understand more about the type of feather that has to be used for flying. And there are certain things that if you look at that video, you can start to see there are, there are different types of feathers, especially the flight feathers and whatnot and the body feathers, and they have different functions. For the record, flight wasn't just invented by the dinosaurs or by the insects. There were many reptiles that flew. The pterodactyl family, which consisted of hundreds of animals uh, and ranged in size from, well, uh, just give me a second. I'll show you this when we come back. Very small animals, and I'll show you a sample, to ones that were taller than a giraffe. You notice this one has teeth. There were no feathers. There, these were actually covered with either hair-like feathers or hair themselves. Some were quite large. And then, of course, there are the flying mammals, the bats. So I'm going to escape that, stop the share. Speaking of pterodactyls, this is a life-size, it's, it's not a model, it's a life-size cast of pterodactyl. That's pretty small. And you can maybe understand how this thing flew. Now it's got wings, it just flaps and takes off. The largest pterodactyl was the size of a giraffe. So if I were to bring it into this room, its leg would go from the ceiling to the floor and the other leg and would probably be wider than my hands can reach. And it's 17 feet high, five meters high, had a wingspan equal to a jet plane. And it flew. So go back to the video. How do you get something that size in the air? We're used to seeing birds as big as cranes or eagles flying around. But how do you get an 18 foot, five meter high pterodactyl, quasiosis, into the air? Well, that gets really back to that video. How do birds get in the air? So if you were to look at these videos, or better yet, contact the Riverwood Conservancy and have asked for a program on flight, you can start to analyze this. But let's just look at the video. The first part of taking or flying is taking off. You've got to get in the air. And it's not easy. Watch the video. How do they do it? Well, birds don't just all of a sudden flap their wings and take off. Birds have to get some lift. Sometimes it's pushing down, literally on the water. Maybe not physically with your feathers, but catching the air in your wings and pushing down to lift your body up. Just watch Canada geese when they start to fluff themselves up. They can almost lift their feet right out of the water without taking off. But that doesn't get you airborne entirely. 
Some birds, if you watch the video, have to take a run. So they need to get air moving. Oh, why do they have to get air moving? Well, there are all sorts of really cool experiments that you can do to illustrate that. But it has to do with airflow. So if the wing was flat, it wouldn't work. But if the wing is curved, it forces the air going over it to go faster than the air going underneath it. This means there's less air pressure. Less air pressure means this is going to push up. So when a bird starts to flap its wings, it's pushing air down, but it's also pushing itself forward and pushing this air over, which is lifting it, which is really cool. Uh, the raven that flies over. Ravens to me really look like they are struggling when they're flying. They're almost like rowing a boat. Um, there is a grace to a lot of birds, but some birds, especially when you watch them in slow motion, and I filmed a lot of that video in slow motion, purposely just to show how these things are actually working. They're, it's not an easy thing. The hummingbird is an amazing bird. It's wings are going so fast. But you can see it when you watch the Canada geese and when you watch the, um, the cranes fly. Now, you take the notion of taking off. Let's say you built a model plane, a paper airplane. You have all the problems with the paper airplane that the bird has. If you build a paper airplane, it doesn't just take off on its own. It needs to be powered. Something has to lift it, in this case, you. I wonder if you could actually lift it without having a person lift it, but you'd need some power. And then it has to go forward. So it needs thrust. So, there is the whole notion of taking off, and I've got a video on that called Take Off or Launching. Then once you're in the air, how do you stay up there? And that's flapping. And the movement of wings, if you watch them in the video, they go, they're going up and down, but there's more than that happening too. They tilt them, they bend them. The feathers, the flight feathers will open up to let air through, they'll curve. It's all delicate. And it's hard to see when you see it in real life, in real speed. But in slow motion, you can start to see that. And then when you're in the air, what do you do in the air? Well, some birds can helicopter. And you'll see, um, if you look at the video, there's a few species that actually helicopter. They're not helicoptering, but they're hovering. They're sitting in one place. So there's a red-tailed hawk that does that in the video. There's a hummingbird that does it in the video. Really cool stuff, but how exactly do they do that? And how do they rotate their arms? Now we're starting to think really going from sort of the grade six type of level program into a high school program, maybe in a university, looking at the mechanics of bird flight. We as humans do not fly like that. Our airplanes do not do a lot of these things but they do a lot of similar things in different ways. Some birds, by the way, when they take off, do go straight up, and that's a leap. And that, by the way, is how they think the pterodactyls got into the air. They think they crouched down and then jumped up and spread their wings, and they got that first flap in, and that took them. So even a five meter high pterodactyl could fly and could take off, because otherwise they just, they just couldn't imagine how they could do this. They had to live on cliffs, and they had to drop off the cliffs and soar, and you had to land on a cliff. Well, that's great, until your food source is a, a dinosaur carcass on the beach, and you have to land to feed on it. Well, then you've got another problem. And then, of course, there's the whole notion of soaring. How do birds soar? Why do they soar? How do they ride thermals? What is a thermal? And just looking at that video, there, there's a shot where a bunch of uh, turkey vultures are going up into the air. How are they doing that? And how do birds avoid hitting each other? So there's a flock of 10,000 snow geese featured. How do 10,000 birds not run into each other? What is the mechanics of that? What is the, the mental 
acuity that's required when you're flying as fast as you can, trying to get away from a bald eagle and trying at the same time avoid hitting another bird. That's that's pretty incredible stuff. And I'm not answering these questions. I'm asking them because I think this is where you want to see the video come into play and get people to start thinking about these things. Well, you're up in the air, you've soared, you flapped. That's great, but then you have to land. And landing presents its own challenges. So there are pictures of birds landing in the video. How do they do it? Um, it's a skill, it has to be learned. Usually, if you're doing it right, it's feet first, um, better than head first. But if you're a young bird, Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So watching the video, look to see how these birds actually land. How do they come in for a landing? What do they do? How do they break? How do they spill air out? How do they use their wings to slow them down? Or do they use their wings to slow them down? And a careful analysis of the video will give you all of that. Um, so that's flight. Hopefully, this will interest some of you enough to contact the River Conservancy, but some of you may just use the video, and that's great too. The videos as a series were designed to illustrate what we can't see and to also get you thinking about things like what this fellow points out. There is so much more to a bird than we really recognize. I would not have thought of the black tips of feathers. I just wouldn't have thought of that. There was a reason for that. And it turns out there is. Nor would I have thought that by looking for that reason, somebody else would figure out why dinosaurs were the colors they were and how they would be able to color the dinosaurs. And that wouldn't have got me looking at books like this and all the birds of the world and trying to figure out, okay, why don't they have white tips? Why doesn't a swan, sorry, a black tip, why doesn't a swan have black tips on its feathers? Is there a reason for that? Well, there has to be a reason. One of them is probably to do with camouflage. So that's flight. And that's my take on it. And I'm going to stop talking now and open it up to some questions. So Stephanie, back to you. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, if anybody has any questions, please post them in the Q&A or the chat section on Zoom. Or if you're watching on Facebook, uh, just comment down below as well. I did see a couple questions come in. Um, the first one from Anne asked, in flight, do their wings touch at all? Um. Now, I'm not sure, Anne, if you're talking about a flock of birds bumping into each other like that with their wings, or whether their wings will actually touch solid objects. The answer to the second question is absolutely. Um, one of the loudest sounds you will never hear is the sound of an owl taking off. They are just so quiet. But the sound you do hear when an owl takes off often is the sound of their wingtips hitting a branch or a twig. You'll hear this click, maybe the twig breaks. And the reason it's so, I say it's the loudest sound you'll never hear. Little chickadee, that was by hand there and the chickadees were flying up. Chickadee sounds like thunder going off when it comes in close. It's, it's loud. And here's a little bird about this big. And here's an owl this big. The owl is quiet. The chickadee is noisy. Quite an amazing difference. Um, I've seen pelicans, their wingtips touching the water occasionally, but very rarely. I mean, that shot of the pelican gliding over the water, how do they do that and maintain like that one or two meter distance from the water? It's just, just amazing ability to fly. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure there are occasions where their wings do touch when the flock takes off but it's very, very rare. 
Uh, another question from Anne is, what is the name of the bird that comes to your hand? I think you just mentioned it. That was a black cap chickadee and Riverwood mm -hmm. is a great place to go and try and feed them. Uh, there are lots of places around, uh, but Riverwood is certainly locally one of the best. Courtright uh, Center is another good place to go, but just about any place there are chickadees around, they will come in to, and then maybe, you know, the question you ask is, why do chickadees come in when robins don't? Well, it has to do with this and this. Take a piece of tape, wrap around your finger, your thumb, and take the tape off, and you get a lot of tape. Do the same thing around your hand, you get more tape. The thumb is going to lose more heat than the hand. That's why your fingertips get colder. The chickadee, being a small bird, is going to dissipate heat more rapidly from its body than a cardinal or a woodpecker. So they need to keep replenishing that heat. So they're desperate for food. If the opportunity to take a risk, to take food out of your hand is there, they may do it. And if they learn that it's safe, they will come in and do it all the time. We occasionally, Riverwood and other places, have woodpeckers that will come in. And they're a much larger bird. They're not as desperate for food. And you won't get four or five woodpeckers vying for food to come into your hand. You might get one, but the chickadee and some other smaller birds, because of their size, they have to get food. And if you're kind enough to offer it to them, that's why they'll come in. So that's got nothing to do with flight, well, kind of energy, but never does. Stephanie, back that's to awesome. you. awesome. I actually, I was down um, near the bird feeders at the bottom of uh, Yellow Trail, very early morning. It was like 7.30 a.m. and the bird feeders were empty and the birds were just all around my head. And even the cardinals had come in super close to yeah. like take a look at me. And I was thinking maybe, I have seen some people feed them from hand before, but I've never done it myself. I know they're they're not as brave as other birds. So it was curious. I had no seed with me, unfortunately. <laughs> I wasn't thinking. <laughs> um, UU has asked, how do you spell the chemical in the feathers that Dave mentioned? Okay, well, I had to look it up in the book before I did this. So I'm going to give you a rough spelling. I think it's M-E-L-A-N-O-S-O-M-E. -E. I might have missed an N in there, but I think that's pretty close to it. Awesome. Look up uh, Michael J. Benton. And I'm sure, because this is what he's known for, uh, I'm sure you'll find it in there. And it's a fascinating read how they discovered this and how they were able to put it up. And he also talks about in this book, Discovering Dinosaurs. This is called Dinosaurs, A New Vision of the Lost World. Very cool. Um, Melanie actually asked, could Dave share the book list he talked about today with me um, to share in the email if possible? I'd be happy to. Um, just quickly, Dinosaurs, New Visions of the Lost World. Uh, Loon Lessons, absolutely an incredible book. And this one, The Complete Birds of the World by Princeton. Every species, 10,700 species. Just a remarkable, as a piece wow. of art, it is an amazing book. But for me as a wildlife photographer, traveling all over the world. I sometimes photograph a bird, I have no idea, but I can get the family. Mm -hmm. I find that uh, this book is quite helpful. I can go to the family birds and narrow it down a little bit. Uh, they're all published in the last few months. Uh, they are really, really good books. Well worth, this one's a little on the pricey side, but um, well worth it. Uh, different drummer, carried this one. I don't know if they still have it. They do have my Black Bear book, but they might also carry this. So I'll put those on the list and I'll give you the author's names as well for Stephanie to share. I'll do that. Wonderful. Thank you. And we just had a couple more questions or comments that came in. Melanie had said, melanocytes are the cells in humans that cause darker skin color, which is a similar word from yes. the Greek root meaning black. So very interesting, very similar words. Yes, yeah, so the darker the skin, and that's talked about in the book. The darker the skin, you have more of those you 
more of these melanin sites that you have. Uh, so it's very related. Um, it's a it's a whole fascinating study. Uh, Benton goes into it in considerable detail, and he talks about how it affects skin color and oh, it just goes on and I on. I found it's, this on the web. Oh, what? <laughs> 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 Siri just comes in and helps me anytime she likes. I hate when she does that. Yeah, shut up, Siri. <laughs> it scares me. <laughs> um, and then one more question for you, Dave, from Patsy. How can I purchase one of Dave's books? You can purchase them through the Riverwood Conservancy. Uh, once we're back in, they do have them. You can order online at uh, Indigo or Amazon, or you can go to the different drummer where they have Sign copies. I know that because I was just in there signing them. So, and if you purchase from the Riverwood Conservancy, if you let me know you're going in, I will be happy to go in and autograph it and uh, sign it to you personally. That's awesome. Okay. And maybe you can include those in your uh, book list as well, and I'll send those out to everybody. Okay. Will okay. Do. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Is there anything final you'd like to say before we say goodbye for the day? Uh, yes, I will be back in a couple of weeks to talk about dinosaurs. We kind of introduced the topic. This was the talk uh, last year that we did that was the absolute disaster because everything that could go wrong went wrong, uh, me and technology. So we're going to try it again, see if it works. Uh, we've got a live walk coming up in April and uh, a few other things coming up in the next month. So keep tuned. And you have a live tracking walk in March too. So lots snow. of cool stuff coming up. Yeah, yeah, if there's snow. <laughs> well, even if there isn't snow, you can track if there's no snow. Yeah. But uh, it's more fun with snow. Awesome. Especially okay, well, freshmen. thank you so much, Dave. It was nice thank seeing you, you and nice seeing everybody. And uh, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.